Hello, everyone. Hopefully you can see us now. We had a little bit of technical difficulties logging in, but uh, we're finally here. And I want to welcome you all to a live artist discussion with our featured exhibiting artist, Gordon McConnell. And we are joined with a rejuvenating curator of the exhibition, Deanne Gilson, who is a services professor at MC Building. So today we are excited to be here with you, and I am honored to be here with Gordon and Leanne, and have the privilege to host this exhibition at Fair Christmas Fair and Museum of Art, and uh, provide this opportunity for our community to learn more about uh, his work. And uh, thank you for being here and joining us. Wherever you are out there in the world wide web, <laughs> and um, know that this is awkward for us as well, <laughs> but we are excited to be here. And um, I am going to uh, introduce Leanne, who is um, has so kindly agreed to be here as well, and um, work with all of us to um, engage uh, Golden's work and kind of peer into who why he does what he has done and, and find out more about who he is and how long he's been working in the arts. Thank you, Nicole. <laughs> Thank you, uh, Sarah Justin, the director here, for having us in this beautiful space. Um, it's an honor to be here with Gordon uh, and to have an opportunity to talk about the work after the of two of Charlie Russell Winters from Trail Supply Line that was superimposed. It was uh, <laughs> a group of jumping cowboys riding away from the saloon and shooting it up, uh, overlaid with a, uh, a cowboy roping a wolf. And uh, I kind of like this, that the two images, uh, and that's what, that is all gone. That is all <laughs> underneath. Uh, years later, I've done a large series of work I call the Panto Empire, which is mostly borrowed from John Ford cavalry westerns, depicting uh, the uh, cavalry soldiers, usually in kind of running fights with Navajo Indians playing Apache Indians. 
and uh, um, and almost I, I posed, you know, I did many of these uh, nine by twelve inch paintings, probably fifty or more of them. I love this show of them in, in the uh, uh, salon style uh, exhibitions at least three high. Um, so there was a lot of dynamism, and and, uh, and to me, uh, this was I did a lot of these in the period of the. Uh, 9-11 and the aftermath, the war in Afghanistan. I thought of the frontier army uh, sympathetically uh, as in the sense of the, the, the two frontier armies, the 1880s and the, and the t early 21st century, uh, the, 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 the terrible sacrifices of, of private soldiers. And I thought about the Afghans, they were fighting in the, the terrorist, uh, uh, the guerrilla warriors uh, who were very comparable uh, to the Apaches who were defending their homeland and their, their women and children and villages and sacred places. Uh, a great tragedy that was played out in Hollywood as a uh, swashbuckling uh, adventure. Uh, so I, I had an idea to put, put a group of these images on one canvas. And the first one I painted is in the center. It, it is the last frame of uh, Fort Apache, where John Wayne is talking to, he has survived a massacre, a so-called massacre, where the cavalry lost and the glorious general was uh, rode off into glory like Custer. And there's a painting on the wall uh, of the, uh, the office that John Wayne is offering. And the newsmen are saying, is, it, does this, is this painting realistic? Does it depict the battle? And John Wayne says, it, well, the, 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 the motif in the painting was, was Colonel Thursday's last chart. In fact, Colonel Thursday was overrun by the masked Indians. And, just died ignobly, but John Wayne says he, yes, that is correct in every detail, his saber charge against the, the Indian. It's the mythology, it's history turning into mythology that we, to, to underscore our, uh, our confidence in ourself and our rightness, uh, we create these constructions. So uh, I painted that part of it, mm -hmm. <laughs> and the words "the end" mm -hmm. with the troops, the, the survive, the, the regiment, regimental soldiers, who of uh, uh, the companies that were not wiped out in that battle, passing in review with the, the lettering of "the end," mm -hmm. and I painted it in black with a black surround. I was going to have a whole group of these photorealistic depictions of frames from other. Cavalry westerns, and that didn't quite <laughs> end it there. Mm -hmm. so, so that set for a couple more years, <laughs> and I had an exhibition opportunity in uh, at the Churchill Arts Council in uh, Fallon, Nevada, and it's an, it's an amazing outpost of contemporary art in a, in a small small town in the Nevada desert. It's a it's actually an oasis of irrigated farming, and. Uh, I kind of took stock of the paint of the the movies that I was thinking about as, as I was creating work for that show. And I'm drawn to art that like the art of Ed Ruscha or uh, Barbara Kruger or, and others who are Jasper Johns who use lettering and words in their paintings. This is gonna this is gonna be the whole program right here. <laughs> <laughs> The whole bear with me. <laughs> so I made I I uh, made an index. I began to think of making an index of and referencing the titles of the films as they appear at the beginning of the films. And to me, that is a painting like that. I mean, if you paint the title, I mean, I I, I tried to capture something of the the essence of film. And if 
I'm thinking about the Wild Bunch, for example, if I paint just the words, the Wild Bunch, does that capture the whole experience in some way, just to put the name out there? So this, this is a complex, I think there are probably 13 movies referenced in this painting. And I loved painting with various uh, type styles and some of them are almost graffiti-like. Okay. Uh, a lot of them are very ornate Victorian kind of lettering. Yeah. Uh, but it was, it, it got to be great fun. And I, it was a way to start using color, which has become a preoccupation for me in the last few years. And telling, I'm done with that. <laughs> no. Telling to me that you kept returning to it, that you would leave it for two years and that you came back to it. And yeah. You leave it and then you came back to it. Um, and you were revising as, as you went. Mm -hmm. And to me, that, that signals the, uh, the depth to which you are attached to reckoning with the idea of the Western film um, and uh, doing that through painting. And so, um, I'm, I'm curious if you could talk, and uh, I know that you move between abstraction and um, figurative painting. So if you could talk a bit about how the translation from the cinematic frame to the painting, how that works for you. How, what's your process like? How do you select a frame? And, and how do you work? And then what, yeah, I'll stop there. Because I think both of us have a tendency to over over explain. So <laughs> <laughs> not me. No, no, I didn't mean that. Yeah. You have a comment? <laughs> no, and I just think also in terms of like people who are not familiar with your work. Let's say right. you haven't come to see the exhibition yes. and you're not familiar. I mean, we want to know too about why you are so familiar with Western film. Okay. Why is this the topic? of yeah. your painting. Yeah. What are you what are you trying to do with that? You know, right. and, and you're working hard at there's an investigation yes. in your work. Yes. You know? Yeah. So maybe tell us a little bit about that and how that goes hand in hand with what Leanne is speaking to you about. Yes. <laughs> I'm beginning to forget her question now because her question is so <laughs> compelling. But we'll see where we we go. Uh, it goes with the my, my origin story is growing up on a farm on the edge of the rangeland, an irrigated farm on the edge of, of rangeland in southeastern Colorado. My dad and grandfather were, were kind of loosely in business together. My dad was growing hay for the ranch and working cattle out there. And uh, I came into their world in 1950. We did and by the time I could begin to remember experiences, we had a black and white television, which my grandmother bought us. Didn't have a lot of money because farming wasn't great in those days. But still, it's an incredible struggle. But uh, we had initially two channels. And uh, I remember coming home from, high, from uh, first grade one day, my dad, uh, being a farmer, could kind of take a break in the middle of the day. And he watched a matinee of John Ford's uh, My Darling Clementine, mm -hmm. which uh, is one of the, I think it's John Ford, it's my favorite of John Ford's films. It's, it's his mythological version of the Wyatt Earp gunfight at the OK Corral saga. And my dad uh, absolutely loved movies and he loved Westerns in particularly, in particular, and he described the gunfight at the end of the movie in vivid detail, vivid detail. And, and if you've seen the film, it is, it is a poetic masterpiece of montage and framing and action cutaway shots that really establish the, uh, what is going on in the space. It's a really well-defined cinematic space. I didn't see that film for years, but uh, some there, there's just a whole series of little awakenings. I mean, the movie, the, the cowboy fair that was standard for kids my age was Roy Rogers and Hopalong Cassidy. But one night they let me stay up late to watch Red River with John Wayne Montgomery Clift directed by Howard Hawks. And it's like Moby Dick on horseback. 
you know, this epic cattle drive, uh, titanic struggle, this, uh, you know, kind of edible feud between the younger man and the older man and just incredible, uh, intense drama. And uh, I saw, I think, I almost can trace an, an aesthetic awakening to seeing that film. And uh, when I moved to Montana to work as a curator at the Yellowstone Art Center, I met, the first night I was in town, I met Ted Waddell, who was, uh, <laughs> who is a famous Montana artist. He, he won the governor's, he received the governor's award uh, two or three years ago. And he's very, he's renowned, he's a brilliant painter, a wonderful man. And he was, uh, he was raising Angus cattle. And in the winter, he's, he, he's, he was an abstract sculpt, sculptor. There's a sculpture of his out in the yard here in <laughs> Paris Gibson Square. It's a steel abstraction that's very masterful in itself. But uh, he was working for his in-laws, managing this ranch and struck, he didn't, he and his wife moved out there and didn't know about ranching very much. And, and he was creative and experimental in the way he approached ranching. And when he had a spare bit of time, he began, he was taking photographs of the cattle and in his barn, in his tool, in his uh, machine barn, he had a, you know, a wood, wood stove and he started painting, he just started painting them. And there's this black silhouettes with these sloppy expressionistic big strokes and just in black and white and blue basically, or maybe, and if it's trying to depict spring, you'd have a little green and mixed with a white or the, you know, but he painted wintry paintings that really were intensely expressionistic and act, active paint. And I was putting together in my own mind, uh, this was a period, it's kind of subsequent to pop art where someone like Roy Lichtenstein looks at a comic book, which is a two dimensional subject. It's not the world. He's he's not painting, uh, you know, the scene from. He's not abstracting a scene from life. He's taking a found object that's flat, like the flat paintings of Jackson Pollock or Mark Rothko, and he's uh, he's looking at that. He's looking at what's there by another artist who was a commercial artist, and. You know, I've talked to, you know, I've talked to artists who were comic book artists and they love what Roy, Roy Lichtenstein did. You know, they, they think he honors them, he elevates it, he makes, he draws attention to the art. So I'm looking at Westerns on TV and I'm, I love them, I love Westerns, I love them. And I, and I, I think the key things I like about it are the landscape and the horses and the music and just the sense of freedom and simplicity. And, and, you know, we're watching part of the Wild Bunch today. I'm thinking, oh, these guys are so terrible. And they make, you know, they're, they're, they are really vivid, realistic depictions of human beings. But, you know, I, I like the scenes where they're riding into the sunset or crossing the Rio Grande on horseback. It's just beautiful. So um, I began to take slides from television, from my little, you know, my little small portable TV, just taking 35 millimeter slides. And there's a lot of precedent for artists working from slides in photorealism. And I began to just project those slides onto paper and then canvas. And uh, Ted gave me this vocabulary. Well, it's abstract expression, it's vocabulary to just really work energetically and quickly and define your forms with energy. And my energy, my, my forms were energy were galloping horses and uh, stagecoaches and, and, you know, just uh, the vivid action of wonderful Western movies. So that's my origin <laughs> in a nutshell. <laughs> the one thing that I am, am hearing is that the experience of seeing those Westerns on that TV screen 
and if I'm putting words in your mouth, oh, go right correct ahead. me. Um, You're a PhD you, scholar. <laughs> allowed you to connect to some sense of an aesthetic that was bigger than you and connected you to a larger world. Mm -hmm. And for me, I think, you know, for my generation, it was being in my basement in Helena, Montana and seeing um, MTV for the first time oh, and okay. the artistry of that, you know, and, and so one thing that I really appreciate about your work is that you see these media um, intersecting. And I was thinking earlier today about how important it is for us as, um, or for me as an art historian or a cultural historian to think about how those visual technologies affect how we understand ourselves. Mm -hmm. Um, and, mm -hmm. you know, each generation, so for me, it might be MTV, for Nicole, it might be MTV for my MTV students. for me, too. <laughs> <laughs> but, well, I mean, what does it love MTV? <laughs> um, Talking the, heads and right? uh, I mean, those, Ramones. Oh, those videos were just, <laughs> yeah. so, I mean, so, so poetic and so experimental and yeah. really inspiring to me. And then for my students, it might be video games or whatever it is, but being mm -hmm. able to speak about what that does for um, you emotionally, like slowing down, trans translating mm. that experience into painting. That's one thing that I really love about your work is it slows me down and, and really makes me appreciate the, the artistry that goes into to filmmaking. I mean, the complexity of your artistry mm. goes into filmmaking. Mm -hmm. um, and These are homages. Yeah. I, cinema is the master dominant art of our of modern times. It, it influenced Picasso, uh, and and uh, I mean the Cubit, Cubism comes out of cinema, mm -hmm. and uh, the collaborative effort. You see the names and the credits of films today, and the miracles done with digital animation, mm -hmm. the epic mm -hmm. films that are done now. Mm -hmm. uh, with people at their computer screens manipulating pixels. It's just mm -hmm. astounding, absolutely astounding. And um, an element with Westerns is that they are not popular anymore. There's an occasionally an art house film, like the re most recent one would be uh, News of the World with Tom Hanks, mm -hmm. which is based on a literary novel and it's grand scale, you know, epic, beautiful film uh, but it's it's not like the not like something that's ground out like uh, I mean the born like a Jason Bourne movie or the Mission Impossible I mean those movies are epic in, too but uh, and ingenious and brilliant uh, and they're but they're more popular <laughs> I mean you know our country our pe people are changing <laughs> There's no, there's not the connection on a, in a mass yeah. audience to the countryside and to riding horses and working with cattle, right. which that, I, yeah. yeah. And that speaks like you were saying, Leanne, as well in your catalog that you've written for your board and is that speaks to your life growing up and how this popular culture of your youth, right, yeah. impacted the way what you create yeah. and when you're both speaking about the technological advances of cinematography and how that's affected you know the popular culture and how we receive it the immediacy of that mm -hmm. and then I agree with you Leanne and how it helps you to slow down because it's interesting how that technology and the popular culture of cinematography which is asking you to go quickly yeah but you're translating it into a very traditional medium, yes. which is painting, yes. which requires you to take a step back and take a deep observation, you know? And I think when Leanne's uh, descriptions in this catalog in her deep conversations with you, I like where that goes next. Yes. And that, in, and maybe you both can talk about that in terms of the layer of there's kind of that emotional depth to the paintings, you know. Yeah, I can talk about the that. meanings mm -hmm. yeah. that you both 
you know, and elaborate so well in this catalog. You know? <laughs> well, thank you. You're Leanne, it's a pleasure. Leanne, <laughs> Leanne revealed a lot of myself to myself that I was not aware of in mm -hmm. the conversations that have uh, continued after the completion of the, of the catalog and a, um, a public forum in Missoula that I attended, uh, conversations from multiple points of view. Uh, um, I will say uh, one of my underlying kind of jokes with these paintings is that in relationship to cinema, painting is obsolete. It is old fashioned. And my subject matter is mostly the era of horse-drawn transportation. So there's, there is an internal sense of amusement about that for me. It's, but, but to your point, the, the work is very, uh, it's seriously in, engaged with the tradition of painting. And I have to tra trace some of it to, um, and, I, and I have to say, I'm an art historian more than I'm trained as an artist. And I have learned more refined techniques over the course of 25 to 30 years and finally, in some of these paintings, I'm, I've achieved a, almost, uh, I, I can't compare myself to Richard Estes, but there's a photorealism in some of them that I'm proud of, that is tedious, that I don't know how I did at this point, because <laughs> I've taken a little intermission from this, but uh, about slowing down the world, um, it, I think I love painting. I love the art of the museums, the art of the churches, the art of tradition. Um, I mean, some of my favorite artists are uh, Edouard Manet, Edgar Degas, um, Frederick Remington, uh, Thomas Eakins. Uh, and I have to go back to, to Rembrandt and, and Goya. And there is a, there's a great book, uh, Anne Hollander, I believe is the author's name called, uh, Moving Pictures. And she talks about graphic art, the prints of Rembrandt, for example, how, how in just black and white and the the compositions of human beings expressing emotion that can touch us emotionally, touch our core, mm -hmm. our humanity. Mm -hmm. And she makes the argument that cinema grew out of that mm -hmm. tradition in art. It's a humanistic uh, concern with the human condition, with, with lived experience. Mm -hmm. and, and, and that something black and white can evoke that. Mm -hmm. it does, you don't have to have technicolor mm -hmm. peacock extravagance to, uh, to touch someone. Um, although colors is an incredible a tool. Mm -hmm. um, but but uh, so I, I, you know, looking at Westerns, looking at individual frames, scenes from them, I, I think of art of the old masters of the, and of the Impressionists and Post-Impressionists and, and uh, the American realists. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, this, there's an image with a, a truck driver looking in his rearview mirror at a cowboy on horseback in the middle of the road. And it, it's a, uh, maybe you could show that. It's yeah. in the catalog yeah. too. Uh, we're gonna yeah. switch, we're gonna flip. Oh, you can do that. <laughs> yeah, those two paintings. I've been talking about those two. That's, yeah, there's the one with the cowboy in the middle of the road and then the one, there it is, Ryan, that's good. Great, thank you. Good. But- The joys of life. <laughs> yeah, this is bad. thank you. <laughs> but uh, that, uh, that multidimensionality, the reflected image, the, the two vanishing points mm -hmm. and the way uh, there's forward movement and backward reflection that, that uh, is very eloquent, I think. And, it, and that's just something I found, but you know, it took me some, it was a challenge 
to capture it in paint. Mm -hmm. I, I think that you wouldn't be able to have such variety of brushwork and uh, if you didn't have that deep love of art history, because I, I or, or you know, study, maybe, maybe it would have evolved naturally, but I, as an art historian, as, as a teacher, it's great to see all of the subtlety in the way that you can paint and how you can move from, you know, um, impressionistic mark making in the hair of the figure you're taking there. Um, and then also incorporate photo realism. Um, you know, the tensions that you create just through mark making um, are really uh, a masterpiece to me. And, and that was one of the great pleasures of seeing this work again uh, in this space, just those passages that teach something. And it's very hard to explain why I like that light touch, that that needed that light touch, or that needs the, <laughs> um, you know, it needs to have those vanishing points that don't go up, that have so much of the meaning of the, of the content. And, and also, just your, your close um, Lonely of the Brave, uh, that scene is just so incredible, um, but that you picked up on the uh, the composition and the, it's so much that's wrapped up in two minutes of a film and distilled it down um, to me is uh, really what I love about painting. Right? Yes. <laughs> um, and what I love about seeing painting in, in person yes. is that ability to convey um, that depth of emotion. Wow. And then there's, you know, you get that rose in the background. Mm -hmm. Soft and so somewhat feminine, and you know, versus those hard lines and foreground, all of that tension that you're seeing is really, it's really what I'm doing. So that's nature that's technology, right? There. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. No, that's a beautiful statement, and you definitely bring profound insight to my work. I'm so grateful. For it. Grateful to Nicole for this beautiful installation. This gallery I did not I felt like this was a smaller show until I saw it in this central gallery at Paris Fifteen Squares, which is almost like a bay and uh, the Menil collection in Houston or uh, the Kimball Museum in Fort Worth but it, the lighting is so exquisitely modulated and uh, I haven't I don't think I saw these paintings as well as well in my easel uh, as I do in the wall here, and to have them all together is, is a blessing. The show is up two more weeks. Well, um, yeah. Thank you, Scott, for trying to forget that. And there's still quite a few more right. weeks for you to come here and see If you're vaccinated, yeah. come see it. <laughs> yes, exactly. <laughs> be grateful. But, That's so funny because I have it ingrained in my head. It's the first week of the morning, like this <laughs> weekend, the first weekend, it was something. Yeah, yeah. I think, yes, like May, May, last, first week of May. And then I'm going to have a storage problem. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know. Right, right. There, there, are, yeah. there are plenty of uh, interesting people. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I already know this. <laughs> oh. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Um, but what, what I wanted to say, and maybe, I mean, I don't even know how long we've been talking because we've had, been having a great conversation. And um, I think something that was interesting to me, because we had a film series here oh, at the museum. Yeah, I'm so glad you mentioned that. And the reason why that happened here was uh, because of Gordon's work, you know. And those of you who are members have been receiving the link to watch the films at home. And um, those of you in the community um, came to watch the movies on Friday and Saturday. And we're ending on The Wild Bunch. And um, there's something indicative about that film. And I think uh, Leanne and Gordon can speak to that mm -hmm. and how the 
the very nature of that film and the other films that preceded it in this series as well all um, reflect the work and are part of the uh, work that Gordon created. But this particular film, which of course I chose to end on this day so that we could kind of tip into that in our discussion was how the, uh, the narrative, the story, the feeling, the meaning, the issues in mm. that film have a thread. You can correct me if I'm wrong. You're right. I'm saying <laughs> in all of your pieces. Not all of them. Mm -hmm. But I'm, I'm Good. saying yeah. in that, you can correct me on this, no. but I feel there's that, uh, that element of darkness. Yes. You know, that many of the films contain yes. on different reading levels as to what's occurring. You know, yes. you know, like a subtle, sometimes very obvious uh, violence yes. and sometimes a very silent one, you know? Yes. But where this film was the epitome of those things yes. and how that resonates in your art making. I know Leanne has spoken to me a little bit about that here. So, yeah. but you are the expert. Okay. The film. Well, so, I've been reading a book. Yeah. <laughs> I, I have to, I'm going to walk down memory lane. I saw that film in 1970. It was released in 1969. A friend and I from Baylor University drove to Dallas to see it. We heard about it. It's a sensational film because of the level of violence in it and also the, but primarily the artistry of it. It is an impeccable uh, masterpiece. Uh, so we went to see that film in the afternoon and then that night we drove to Fort Worth and saw the Jefferson Airplane concert. This was the 1960s, 19, early, early 1970s. When they were filming The Wild Bunch, it was uh, when they filmed the climactic battle scene where the outlaws out last stand against a unit, a unit of the Mexican army and the machine gun employed in it coincided exactly with the knee line massacre in Vietnam. And Sam Peckinpah, the film's director, and his the, the the other screenwriter, Waylon Green, were deeply familiar with Mexico and Mexican history, and uh, and deeply interested in human nature. And at this time, there were books like uh, Robert Ardrey's African Genesis, which talked about the, the latent tendency or inevitability of violence in, in human nature. And Sam Peckinpah had seen uh, that popular movie, uh, The Magnificent Seven, <laughs> which depicted Mexican villagers as helpless prey to a marauding band of Mexican outlaws. So they have to hire these professional American gun to pool all the villages' resources and not hire, which is a pittance. And these gunmen are at the end of their road and they go to this Mexican village and fight the bandits. Peckinpah hated that film. It was false on every level. And he wanted to make a, a movie that was situated precisely in the history of the Mexican Revolution and to locate that, which was right before World War I began. And German military advisors were involved in supporting the, uh, the Mexican army who were fighting Pancho Villa and the other uh, insurgents. And um, the Mexican army as it's depicted in the film is run by a warlord named Mapacho, who is the most, he's one of the most vivid vill villains in film history. But with little graces of humor and charm, he's a great 
Mexican actor and film director named Julio Fernandez. Uh, I could talk for three hours about the world, <laughs> but but I watching a little bit of it this afternoon. I was seeing uh, references to John Ford's westerns. There, there's a scene at the beginning where there's a temperance move, temperance meeting. And they march away from the meeting with a band playing, Shall We Gather at the River, that great hymn, which John Ford used in multiple films in his Westerns. And uh, there were various uh, compositions where the camera was set up with, with the horsemen riding into the, the town, uh, the way things were framed, and the gestures that echoed countless other Westerns. Mm -hmm. And Sam Peckinpah had been a film, a, a TV director. He directed The Rifleman and other TV series where the hero week after week had some kind of showdown with someone and killed them dead with no, con you know, it was just part of the story. There's no, no visceral impact to that. And it, it deadened people. I mean, I think it was a, very, it was a kind of a toxic pathological type of popular culture. And this, this artist wanted to show violence in all of its ugliness. And, and, and you know, Clint Eastwood is acclaimed for the unforgiven more recently. Uh, but I think The Wild Bunch is a much more complex, devastating trail. Capacity, the negative capacity of human beings. And yet, the center of the simple characters are these outlaws. They're from the Old West. They're, they have a code. They're loyal to one another. They, they're wily and, and, you know, and humorous. I mean, and he didn't, I mean, they're, and they're awful. I mean, they are just absolutely <laughs> awful, awful men, but they're played with great. Powered by actors who were William Holden, Edmund O'Brien, who kind of washed up in their careers. And, and they came back and they, it's just something that embodied their experiences. I can't say much more. Did I miss your question? Miss your point? I think you were, I think you got to a lot of what I was okay. asking. And then I think that the only what I was trying yeah. to say too was just like, how does that? How um, the that film, particularly the themes of that film, how are they made manifest in your in your art? You know, I think I operate more on the. Uh, I draw more from the classic westerns that are a little that are a lot more circumspect mm -hmm. in the portraying these themes. Yet. Uh, the underlying theme is uh, existential. It's life or death. It's survival. It's uh, doing what needs to be done. And, and often, you know, I mean, courage, you know, the Hemingway like uh, grace under pressure. The, the, and Hemingway is a character. <laughs> um, I think there's a lot of nobility in. Western film characters. And they set up an example uh, of masculine. I mean, we were talking about men. They're, they're wonderful. I mean, more recently, the films that really deal with women in an honest way, and women's roles in the West, and, and um, other points of view. But I think there is something foundational about human existence even if it is clad with a lot of romanticism or evasion or uh, erasure. I mean, I, yeah. These gunfighters that I, I mean, I, I concentrate more on the kind of gunfighter West than the, I mean, I did focus on Indian Wars to some extent, but I, I'm keenly sensitive to contemporary Native American artists and their autonomy, their, their 
ownership of their cultures and images. And, and they don't like to be thought of in terms of people that existed 100 years ago. They, they're, they're here with us. They're, they're part of our world today. I mean, they're our friends and neighbors and our fellow artists. Um, so that's not my burden. I'm, I'm operating in this imaginary space of Matt Dillon and Gunsmoke. That's a crass version of it, but mm -hmm. I'm in that. It's almost like a Virgil Brecht theater, right. it's a theater it's where, where things are reduced, yeah. it's simplified mm -hmm. and, and maybe distorted. But, right. but it is about life and death. Mm -hmm. To me, that means something. Well, and I was gonna, I was thinking as you were talking about the, these characters is that the way that you reposition them for me in these compositions is not the way I mean, mm. they're, they're often somewhat fragile or mm. evaporating or can't see their face. And, um, and you know, I characterize your work through this as, as um, some sort of personal reckoning for you mm -hmm. um, in a bypass between your, uh, your childhood and your experience growing up uh, exposed to a West that was disappearing mm -hmm. um, and your connection to your father and all of those things. And so for me, I mean, the mood is very, it's, it's, uh, it's not nostalgic. I don't know how to, like, I, I struggle to find the right word for but it's, it's, there is a, um, a moodiness there, you know, and it's, uh, and it's difficult at times, um, and it, you know, sometimes some of these punch me in the gut, um, mm -hmm. the way that, uh, a shadow, I'm, I'm seeing another cross again, mm -hmm. and I, you know, there are crosses that, um, that are cast at, uh, across the landscape, um, to suggest for me the way that our American psyche is haunted by you know these stories that we inherited yes. Yes. Um, of the heroes and villains and our need to to work through that um, as a means of moving forward you know personally culturally um, and together uh, and part of the one of the things that you said that that really touched me and that I love as a curator and will probably can speak to this as well is that the process of curating is about coming to know more about yourself and more about the artist mm -hmm. in the process of the conversation. And for me as well, as you know, you and I really respect what you said that um, that you know more about yourself as an artist because that's my that's my greatest hope as a curator or as a teacher yes. is that I can you know move you to another level at the same time that I am also getting insight into why am I drawn to this mm -hmm. right? and that it, as a curator I work somewhat mm -hmm. instinctively about um, you know that that goes with this and I'm not sure why yet but then in the process yes. of writing, you bring it all You're together. working in person. Yeah, and that's the art of, that's the art of curating, that's the art of writing. And as a writer and a curator, yes. <laughs> and an artist, you see, yes. you, the value, you, know, you see how it all works. I couldn't value the type of work that both of you do. The preparation that you've made back at the Newport, the investment of your hearts, passion, into fields that a field that isn't lucrative. You do it out of you, you know, it is a communitarian, uh, progressive, uh, constructive endeavor that I deeply respect, appreciate. Um, and I'm I, I came to Montana as a curator too. <laughs> By comparison to these two women, I, I was an amateur on the frontier. And it hardens me that that scholars of your of your of your standing uh, are digging into this place which is not quite as raw as it was when, but I, I know there was a lot going on here in 
incredible community and they're you know an incredibly large population of interesting artists for a sparsely populated state yeah. um, and i i love being here i love being here among you and it's so rewarding to to be honored this way i am so You know what? We all learn from one another. And I think that's the important part in my life. The takeaway is it's just a series of like, conversations that continue through those connections, through the people we know, through the research that's done, through the exhibitions, through our community who watches and listens and continues the story of the connections. And so I think having said that, um, we might end our discussion because uh, it was filled with so much. It was like a little trip. <laughs> no, it was. Yeah. It was. It was a trip through your mind, your history, your work, your connections, and the deeper levels of understanding in your work. And I hope that. For those of you who have not seen the exhibition, that you take the time to see and connect to it. And I think at the end, when I look at the work, uh, I just think about that deeper understanding of the burden of what is American identity. Yes. Mm -hmm. You know, and how everybody has their own version of it. Yes. Mm -hmm. And when we, when I look at your work, Gordon, I see that version and the permutations of it and the disembodiment of the images from their original context, much in the same way that I think that each individual can be seen. Like we are individuals living in this world, influenced by Phil, influenced by those around us showing us ways to live you know our american aesthetic you know and so i think we're all better people when we have individuals like you and yeah we're bringing that information to us so that we can begin to read ourselves by looking inward at other people's work so i thank you both so much for sharing your depth of knowledge, your experience, and your time. But everybody online, hello, <laughs> goodbye. <laughs> um, thank you so much again. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for the brilliant summation. Thank you. <laughs> bye bye, everybody. Bye, friends. We never quite know when it's ended, just so you know.